All right, so 22 chapters, and we haven't even, I mean, we've, 22 chapters of the Bible we've covered over the course of the past months. Um, 22 chapters, the first couple thousand years <laughs> are really covered in like the first 10 chapters of the whole Bible. So the first couple thousand years of existence are covered in the first 10 chapters. And the rest of the Bible after that is all about the coming of the Messiah and how it lays out within the law, the coming of the Messiah and how it lays out within uh, the prophets. Certainly, you know, what we're to learn through the books, the historical books in the Bible. And then finally, the coming of the Messiah in the New Testament, the, the first advent, if you will. There is the, you know, the first coming of God. And he came unto his own. And John tells us that his own received him what? No. He came unto his own, and his own didn't receive him. And so then he went out to the rest of the world. So all of those things, the Bible in and of itself, and this, this big book written by many human authors, written by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Bible is about Jesus. Every page that's, on, that's in this book is, is about the Lord Jesus and about His relationship to us. It's about God the Father and His relationship to us through His Son. It's about the work of the Spirit and His relationship to us under the authority of the Son. This whole book is not just a book of tools for us to get through life. It tells us, and it is that, it is very much that. But it's more than that. And throughout the Bible, we have a couple of examples as to what redemption looks like in the body of Christ, or certainly in the person of Christ, rather. If you read Isaiah 53, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It actually starts a little bit further back in Isaiah 52. You know, the, the scholars of the, of the olden days, they put in the chapter breaks and the verse breaks for us because they wanted us to be able to study the Word of God together. But those chapter breaks and the, and the verses within those chapters are not inspired Scripture. It's important for us to know that. But Isaiah 53 gives us the crucifixion from our point of view. And certainly even Psalm 69 gives us, well, not so, not so much Psalm 69. Psalm 22 and Psalm 69 give us the crucifixion from the Son's perspective. Isaiah 53 gives us the crucifixion from our perspective. Genesis 22 is the crucifixion from the Father's perspective. It's it's giving us a glimpse into the heart of God, the Father, unlike anything else written in the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Genesis 22 gives us, it gives us a snapshot as to the reality of what was going on in Golgotha at the time of Christ's crucifixion. And it gives us the heart of God in this. But it doesn't come with some cost. Now it comes with the real story of the real character and the real historical man of Abraham. Abraham being a real guy. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I sing it all the time. I am one of them and so are you. Let's just praise the Lord. So that's a real kid song that I can still sing to this day. Something I learned in kids church when I was this big. <clears throat> I never really understood what it meant, but now I do. Abraham comes out of separating his firstborn son of the flesh, which was Ishmael, and had to put Ishmael and his mom, Hagar, had to put them out. It was a little dispute in the camp, so to speak. And Hagar and Ishmael started to resent, so to speak. They started to resent um, the birth of the son of promise. And when there was some contention within the home, Sarah goes to Abraham and says, okay, here's the deal. She's got to go. She's got to go, and so does the boy. So out they went. But God saw her, and God's promise to her was real. God said, don't worry, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of your son. He's going to be a great nation. Ishmael was, in fact, and his, his nation is still around to this day. He made him a great nation, made him a great name. 
took care of them. But now it came that came time that the Lord was going to start to separate, really start to separate his people, his chosen people. You get Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You hear those three names often quoted in the Old Testament. You hear, I am the God, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would say that to Moses. He would say that to David. He would say that to many, many people throughout the Bible, only to reaffirm who they are talking to and the covenant that he made with Abraham. So God makes a covenant with Abraham, but that covenant doesn't come at no cost. If the Lord is going to use Abraham, then he's going to have to test him. If he's going to use Abraham and he's going to make him the father of many nations, and through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That was the promise of God. Through him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And we love hearing that, right? We love, we dig. Listen, when God gives us promises, I love the promises of the Lord written in the Bible. I dig them. But we never really want to go, go down the road that it takes to lay claim to those promises sometimes. We read things in the Bible. There are certain promises, and there are certain really lofty, very uplifting uh, thick portions of Scripture that we all love to hear. I love to hear that one day I'm going to go to heaven and walk on streets of gold. I love hearing that. I love reading that. But that doesn't come with walking through this life first. It just doesn't. The promises that God made to Abraham came with some testing. There's 25 years since Abraham heard the familiar voice of his friend. You know that in the Bible, that's what Abraham is called. Abraham is called the friend of God. Abraham is called the friend of God. Moses was the man, you know, who really understood God's ways. If you do a character study on some of these guys, the patriarchs of the Old Testament, Moses was somebody that, that really knew God's ways. He really knew God's heart. He really understood God's heart to, towards people. Moses really knew God's ways. But Abraham was a friend of God. He considered God to be a very personal friend of his, the creator of the universe, the creator of everything that we see and survey. 25 years pass after his birth, and he hasn't heard the voice of God in 25 years until this point. Now it came to pass after these things in verse 1 that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, now, We're going to see some firsts here. And he said, here I am. After walking with the Lord for all of these years, God calls on him, and he now answers him when he calls him. He doesn't just wait to hear from God. He says, here I am. It's an interesting kind of posture in the verbiage. It's an interesting posture that we see where Abraham, as soon as he hears the voice of God, he stops what he's doing and says, here I am. I'm listening. You've got my ear. He says, here I am. And then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. The first time in a couple thousand years of biblical history that we see the word love in the word of God. The very first time. The very first time, and it's used here in reference to God wanting to show us how much he truly loves his own son. Listen, all love in the world, true love, is based on God's love for his son. Mother-daughter love is not the strongest love. Father-son love on an earthly, on an earthly level is not the strongest love there is. Mother-son love, father-daughter love, husband-wife love. All the mushy stuff that we like to like tattoo on ourselves. None of that stuff is the strongest love that there is. The greatest love of all is not as, in stark contrast to Whitney Houston, inside of you. It's not. The greatest and the strongest love that they could ever be is the love of God the Father to God the Son. That is it. And this is where we start to see that. We start to see that kind of unravel. We start to see God showing us how much. I mean, he waited so long to show us and to reveal to us this one word, this word love. He waited a long time. I mean, there's lots of people here. 
Lots of, lots of children have been born up until this point. In the Word of God, we've seen all sorts of people born, die. But He waits until now to tell us and to give us a glimpse into His heart as to how much He really loves His Son. So He says this, And then He said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He says it again. He's going to repeat that over and over again. It's worth noting. I don't know if you're into writing in your, writing in your Bible, but you should underline how many times he writes his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now the question often arises, <clears throat> why? I ask God that all the time. I probably shouldn't, but I do. I ask God, why do these things happen to us? Why are you asking me to do this? Why can't I just understand things and not have to go through testing and trials and troublesome times? Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons. <clears throat> As you look through Scripture, I wrote some of these down. You can write them down and you can just memorize them. That's fine. It'll be a test at the end of the night. Maybe one of the reasons why God decided to test Abraham was that all too often times, we as people start to, we worship the creation rather than the creator. That's the natural pretense of our hearts, okay, as human beings. We will start to worship the blessings rather than the blesser. You understand? We will start to, I mean, Abraham was told from a long time ago, prior to, this, prior to this point, he was told that he was going to be the father of many nations, that all the nations of the world will be blessed through him and through his seed, and that, and that he was promised this kind of great ingathering. And he was promised this at a very old age. And then all of a sudden, the Lord starts to restore to him his health. He starts to restore Sarah, her health. She starts to nurse. She gives birth. And all of a sudden, there's the son of promise, born as God said. And it's really easy to become overwhelmed with joy over the blessing, over the blesser. Does that make sense? It can be really easy when the Lord blesses us and gives us what we want and gives us things that we've been praying for to become all too preoccupied with that thing now rather than the one who gave us that thing or that person. And it's one reason it's a possibility. Maybe in their family and in their family dynamic, and this is, this is all conjecture, I and mean, it's nothing in the Bible actually says these things, but as humans, we have to think that there is some reason as to why God wanted to take the most valued person in Abraham and Sarah's life and say, I want you to offer him now. Offer him up. And he does that with us. He does that with us. All too often times we wind up getting ourselves caught up in the material things of this world. And every once in a while the Lord has to question us and say, do you love me in spite of all of this? Do you love me in spite of all the things and the ways that I've blessed you? Do you are you still going to worship me? Are you still going to follow me if I take these things away? You know, and I think about even the, in, in the world of, you know, well, in, our, in our own evangelical Christian world, think about the reasons why people stop coming to church. Think about the reasons why people will stop coming into fellowships. There are people who will not come to church, come to our church down on Main Street because it's too small. Or it's right on Main Street, it's too loud. Or there's too many distractions. And God ministers to people where they're at. Think about what causes us to kind of stumble and fall. All of a sudden the Lord gives us a great job. We're making all sorts of money, and the Lord is blessing. He's blessing. He's blessing. And you go to church, you start giving on a regular basis, you tithe it. All of a sudden, the Lord is, is blessing more, and He's blessing more, and you are just walking on cloud nine. I mean, you couldn't be more happy. You got a chance to buy a car, buy a house. You're really starting to provide for your family, or you're really just kind of buying some stuff that you wanted, and you are just praising God. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus all the time. But then all of a sudden, your cage gets rattled a little bit, and you lose your job. All of a sudden, your cage gets rattled a little bit, and you start, you, watch, you start to watch your bank account really start to dwindle. And the Lord starts to test your faith just a little bit. And I have to say, why? Why can't things just be great all the time? 
Why can't things just be fine? I mean, Lord, I mean, because this is the, these are the things that we go through. These are the questions I ask. I mean, Lord, look at all the things. And listen, just from a pastoral standpoint, these are questions that I go to God with all the time. Lord, why am I having to suffer through these things in my life? Can't you see what I'm doing for you? That's the truth. That those are real questions. I'm sorry, but you, you know, when you start to really sacrificially live and give and do and do and do and do, and all of a sudden, then you're doing all this stuff for the Lord, and then you're getting hammered on the side. You start to go to God and you say, Lord, what is going on? Don't you see what I'm going through? Why? For who I think I am. Why? Maybe... It's just to prove out what we really love. Maybe it's just to prove out. Maybe the Lord just wants us to get down to brass tacks with him. Maybe he wanted that for Abraham. Who do you really love? Who are you really following? What are you really doing? What are you really doing on this earth? He was dwelling in the land of memory, and we all know that Abraham was known as the man of the tent and the altar. But maybe he was starting to spend a little bit too much time where he was. And God had to get him on the move again. Testing grows us. It really does. It grows us, and it does a couple of things. It teaches us about the depths of the ocean. It's really difficult to tell people about the depths of the ocean unless you've been there. It's really hard. I mean, I, I've never been to the bottom of the sea. Never. I've watched all sorts of videos. I'm a, I'm a nature kind of National Geographic freak. I don't buy into all the evolution nonsense. I kind of laugh at it whenever I hear about it. But I look at those videos and I'm like, man, what a trip. But you know what I can tell you about? There was a time I jumped out of an airplane. I'm going to tell you something. What you see on TV ain't even at all like really jumping out of an airplane. Really jumping out of an airplane is, is something that, you know, is something that you'll never really truly get the experience of unless you really do it. A couple of things I've seen and I've watched. I've watched some things on TV with regard to fires and all that stuff. I've walked into a burning building. I know what that feels like. It's hot, really, really hot. And I can explain it because I've been there. But that doesn't come without actually doing it. You can tell somebody all about the love of Christ and how the Lord will provide for you if you just trust in God. And then God says, you know something? He's right. Watch this. And he'll take that person and use them <laughs> as an object lesson. And he does that here with Abraham. Testing teaches us to rely and to trust, rely on and to trust God. It really does. Pressing teaches us to rely on and trust in God and to remember that He is the provider. Testing also shows us what we're made of. It also shows us what we're made of. And I use this example a lot. My mom, years ago, she was always, she was into... Um, drying out flowers and putting together all sorts of floral arrangements and stuff like that, you know. So my house would often smell like flowers. You know, you walk into my house, it would smell like flowers. That was her studio. But the best way to actually smell what a flower really smells like is if you dry it out and you crush it, and then you can really, and you put it up to your face, and you can really smell the aroma of that flower. I mean, it's unbelievable. Because it just kind of, you know, little particles of that flower will just kind of flake off and dust up and you can just, re you just get the full, I mean, just the full aroma of that thing. And that's what crushing does to us. It shows us what we're really made of. Crushing us and testing us shows us what we're really made of. And that's what testing does. And testing... It shows God's faithfulness. It shows God's faithfulness. And it shows His power. 
because God is faithful. And to the believer. Listen, God supplies even to the non-believer. You get that. God supplies to the non-believer, even those who deny his existence, for those who hate God, for those who blaspheme his name. The Bible says that the rain falls on who? The just and the unjust. The rain falls on who? God provides for all of them, even though they deny him, they deny his existence, they deny his love, they deny his power, they deny his sonship, they deny his authority, they deny his creative power, they deny everything about him, but yet God still clothes them, feeds them, causes them to have families, causes them to have great jobs. He still provides for them, even though they deny him. But for the believer, for the believer, it's a little different because there are things that we know. Abraham now has been walking with God for some time. And the Lord will put us in a position where we really got to put our money where our mouth is and say, he is the one who provides for me. Not the labor of my hands. He is the one who provides for me. He's the one who said this. Now, we don't know what conversations God has with Abraham after this point. He's going to show him the mountains that he's supposed to take his son, his only son, to. And he's going to offer him a burnt offering there. Now, listen, we don't know how that conversation went down. All we see is the action. But God, listen to me. Hear me on this. Throughout the scriptures, you will never be able to outgive God. God always honors faith. He always honors faith. He honors obedience. And he honors a quick foot. Abraham woke up early the next day. That's what the scripture tells us. He was ready to go. And I'm sure he was wrestling with all sorts of thoughts in his mind. I'm sure he was, a, he was a human guy. The reality of this really sinks in with all of us. God tells us to do something and he starts putting on our hearts uh, 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 to do something for him or to serve him more, or to sacrifice more of our lives, the lives that we think is our own and it's not. Your body is not your own. Your life is not your own. Your life is hidden in Christ. And God is going to use that. He's going to. In verse 3, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men, two of his servants, with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, he'd probably been staring at it a while, but it's worth noting. Do you ever, see, do you ever have these moments with God? Do you ever have these moments where you're looking at something. Do you ever have a moment you lose something? You lose it. You lose something. You lose something. Like the other day I was running through church here. The other day I was running through church here and I lost my keys. My keys were in my jacket. And guess what my jacket was? My jacket was right in front of me. Right in front of my face. Now listen, the fact of the matter is that all I needed to do was just take a harder look at where it was. All of a sudden Abraham lifts his eyes, probably staring at this mountain range for who knows how long. And God shows him. After three days, this is it. In verse 4, it says, Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and look at this, and worship. And we will come back to you. Hear me on this. There was not a question in his mind. There wasn't a question in his mind as to he didn't know how this was going to happen. All he knew is that he was going to come back. Something was told to him about the resurrection. Something was told to him about n knowing that God was going to revive Isaac, not just after he'd been slain because he had to offer him as a what? A burnt offering. Which means that he was going to, he knew that God was going to be able to pull him out of the what? The ashes. That he would bring beauty from ashes. But there's also else. 
something else that we have to look at here. If, we, if, we're, if this is a snapshot into God's heart, into what happened on Mount Moriah, by the way, which is where, exactly where Jesus was crucified, in Golgotha, this is the same mountain. Same mountain, same place. You go to Israel today, Golgotha is Mount Moriah. There's something here that we see that goes on between the Father and the Son that no, no one else can go to. There's a separation. That we as His servants, we as the servants of God, we can't partake in this. There's something, there's something special that happened on Golgotha. There's something eternally special and different that happened between the Father and the Son that no one else can partake in. The only thing we can do is reap the benefit. Something happened where the servants weren't able to go there. The servants weren't able to go to the place where God the Son and God the Father would do business. This had to be something between them. We reap the benefit. And I will go yonder and worship. Worship never comes without sacrifice. Hear me on this. We come together. Listen, one of my favorite things to do, one of my favorite things to do in the world is to come to church and worship and sing praise songs. Honestly, it really is. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love worship. I love singing to God. I love watching other people worship. But worship never comes without sacrifice. True worship is sacrificial. True worship, listen, I'm going to tell you, we all love coming and praising God for all the good things He does. We love praising God for all the times that He's provided. But would you still worship Him if it caused you to sacrifice something? Would you still serve Him to the same degree that you're serving him now if he started to take some things away from you or called you to do the same thing. Listen, that's why, do you know that that's why God calls us, calls us to tithe? Do you know that? That he uses, and listen, you guys know, we don't pass a plate here. We don't have triple gave Sundays. We don't sit there and preach every three sermons about money. Giving is between you and the Lord. We got boxes out there. Good for you. You want to give? Give. If God puts it on your heart to give a tenth, praise the Lord, hallelujah. But I'm going to tell you something. God uses money to test you and what you worship. He uses it. He uses money to test you and what it is you're going to worship, whether you're going to offer it to Him, your life to Him, and you're going to give Him everything that you have, and you're going to give Him that by way of worshiping in what you value. What you value. And if you don't have money, what do you got? Sometimes you get time. Time is always sacrificial because there are those times on Sunday where I'd like to be watching the football game too. There are those times during the week where I get a big job that I want to go nail down and I can make a ton of money, but I have to give it up. There are those times where we have those. We can sacrifice time, talent, treasure. All of those things. True worship never comes. We can come here and we can praise the Lord and hallelujah. Raise our hands, clap our hands and hallelujah. Praise Jesus. God bless you. Good to see you tonight. Let's get around the word. Let's hear about Jesus. Go home happy, filled, engaged. And then walk out and then there's no sacrifice of your life at all. Walk out of here and there's no sacrificial living at all. No sacrificial giving. No sacrificial anything. That's real worship. It's real worship when you're going through it. Listen, hear me on this, because many of us have experienced this here. It's real worship when you're really going through it and you're really being pressed. And you can still come here and say, praise Jesus. That's worship, man. When you're just being pressed and just, you are being crushed. You are hard-pressed on every side. But you're still going to praise Jesus. Because you've walked through these things maybe once or twice before. And you know that he's got you. Abraham knew, knew that God had him and he had his son. He told his servants to stay back. In verse 6 it says, So Abraham took, took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac. It's also worth noting that that's the first time that we see the word worship in the Bible. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife. And the two of them went together. 
But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So now at this point, Isaac is starting to deduce that there's something missing. Something's not there. How are we going to worship with an offering, with a burnt offering, but I don't see a sacrifice? I want you to look at his answer in verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide. The word for is there, and we can do all sorts of linguistic kind of ping pong, but the word for is there. It's not so much a misprint, but it's even better understood if you read it like this. My son, God will provide himself, the lamb, for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Interesting. It's really a very interesting study. I mean, you could go, I mean, days and weeks just studying that one verse, honestly. You guys know that lamb in the Gospels is never mentioned in any of the synoptic gospels, the synoptic gospels being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The only other time, the first time in the New Testament, in the gospels, that we see the word lamb introduced to us is in John chapter 1, where John the Baptist is down by the River Jordan, and he lifts up his eyes, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, sent to take away the sins of what? the world the question that's asked here by Isaac thousands of years prior to Christ gets answered in John chapter 1 where is the lamb and John chapter 1 says behold the lamb God will provide himself you see this God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering so the two of them went together In verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood, look at this, in order. And he bound Isaac, his son. Keeps on repeating that. Important to note that. He bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, and here he is, here I am. You have to put yourself in the story. You have to really ask yourself if you can really, if you would be, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I have, I have kids. I get sons and daughters. I don't know. I don't know that I'd be able to do this. I don't know if anybody would really truly be able to do this. I don't know. The faith that God gave gave Abraham to do this is incredible. Incredible. But if God was going to use him, listen to me, if God was going to use Abraham, he had to make sure that Abraham was a yes man. Listen to me. If you don't get anything out of this, get this here now, especially for those of you who want to serve and want to grow in the church. God uses yes men. He uses them. God will use somebody who is willing to do something even if it doesn't make sense to them. He will use somebody who is willing to say, yes, God, here I am. Yes, I will do that. As crazy as it sounds, he uses men and he uses women. He uses people who are willing to listen to him and those people who are willing to do the crazy thing even though they don't really understand why. God uses those men and those women. He will. And he had to make sure, not that God didn't know, but God wanted Abraham to know that he was going to provide. And sometimes the only way to do that in our lives is for him to bring us right to the edge. And sometimes I just wish it wasn't that way. I do. I mean, we all do. Sometimes I just wish. Sometimes I wish that there was just an easier way. 
I mean, there's got to be some easier way for God to show me that he's all-powerful, loving, caring. There's got to be some other way. And you know, a couple of months ago, I remember when we were down the street, a couple of months ago, when, when the spiritual warfare really started ramping up, and I would pray. I would, I would get along with God, and I would say, Lord, I know that there's just a bunch of people right now in the church, and everybody's just kind of getting hit on every side. Everybody, and listen, and as a, as a pastor, as a parent, you guys see, it's, again, I, please don't, this is not to be condescending or pretentious, but every once in a while, you see your kids, and you, you see your kids kind of going through difficult stuff, and you want to keep them from going through anything difficult, because you don't, you don't really trust that they're going to make it. You see children going through difficult things. You see children going through taxing times. You see children when they grow up, and you always get nervous for them, and you always want to kind of cushion the blow of all the things that they're going through. And so what do you do? You, sometimes you kind of you get in the way of them going through difficult things. And so I'd see people kind of going through hard stuff. I see people going through difficulties, and I'm like, Lord, what do I do? They're going through this really hard time, and I, I, we've got, I just want to help them and get them through. And he's like, no, no because I'm doing something here, and you don't want to get in the way of the Lord doing something. Listen, don't ever be afraid of letting somebody hit rock bottom. Don't get in the way of when the Lord is starting to do some things. Take a look at your own life. Remember the, you remember the time when you were at rock bottom, and nobody helped you. Nobody was there helping you, but God still came through. He still came through. He didn't leave you alone. He didn't leave you alone. I go, to the, I go through these things even with my own son, my own children. Lord, I don't want them to do that. I want to just kind of let them do what they want. I want to, nope, you got to let them, got to let them go through some pain. Because after that, at this moment, God intervenes. And I can tell you, I, listen, I only know, there are those times, those moments in time where, you know, you ever just, like, you don't know what's going on, and all of a sudden, man, you just start to well up. You ever get tears welling up in your eyes and you can't even see? And you know that Abraham right now is questioning God. The humanity is here. He's not superhuman. We have read all through the chapters of the Bible since we got to this point that Abraham makes mistakes, he makes bad judgment calls, he's done some things wrong, and he's done some things really, really wrong. God's still been with him. And you know that there's tears in his eyes. You know that he's got that knife in the air. And you know that he's about ready to swing that thing down and just drive it right through his only son. He's about to do it. Because that's, that's where God meets us. He's ready to go. And if you could kind of put this in your mind, think about this for a second. He's a professional altar builder, by the way. He's been building altars since he had interactions with God. He's the man known of the tent and the altar. He's been building altars. I mean, there's burnt altars all over the place. Everywhere he goes, there's just burnt altars everywhere he goes. He, he knows how to build one. He puts the wood together. He makes it perfect. He builds an altar. He binds up his own son. Ties him, probably hand and foot. Abraham, look at this in verse 10. It says he stretched out his hand. Do you know what that means? That means his hand was right here. There was only one more move. Stretched out his hand. He had the knife in his hand. And as he was ready to go, he went, and God just, boom, stops him dead. Ready to go. He was ready to drive that knife right down to the bolster. ready to go. And God, I love this. You know my favorite two words in the Bible. It says, but God. Those are my favorite two words. When we're lost and dead in our trespasses and sins in Ephesians chapter 2. But God. But God calls those things that are not as though they are. But God intervenes. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. I bet he was glad to hear that voice. And he said, don't lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know 
that you fear God, since you have not withheld, here it is again, your son, your only son, from me. The word fear, you do a word study there, it's a, it's a wonderful word. We kind of have a tough definition in the English, but in the Hebrew, there is no greater word for reverence. There is no greater word for reverence and respect than that word fear. And then Abraham, probably with a huge sigh of relief, says Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. Look at this. Instead of his son. Every once in a while, God will ask you what you're willing to give up. He will. He'll ask you what you're willing to give up and he'll get you right to the edge. And every once in a while, he just wants to prove to you for our benefit that he's our provider. And how do we know? Verse 14 says it very plainly. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. Literally, that's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld, here it is again, your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you obeyed my voice. Do you see that? <laughs> because you listened to me. Because of the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose what? Heart is loyal to him. God is looking for people who are loyal. He's not looking for the smartest. He's not looking for the strongest. He's not looking for anybody. He's not looking for the richest. He's not looking for the poorest either, by the way. He's looking for the loyal. He's looking for loyalty, faith. And by the way, you will never outgive God. Ever. Ever. Whether it's with time, talent, or treasure, you will never, ever outgive God. God gave him a son, and he said, Abraham, what are you willing to do now? The son that I promised you, here's what I want you to do with it. Because it's a son that I gave you. I promised you he belongs to me anyway. Even though he's got your name, he's probably got your eyes, he's got your blood type, he's got your family line right in him. And in his seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the, he the seed had to come through Isaac. But Abraham said, okay, that's cool. That's it. Fine. I've walked enough with God and I've seen God come through enough times. I'm just going to listen. Listen. I'll put the gloves on with God enough times myself. And maybe you have too. I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with God enough times myself. Walked through enough times. Heard from God enough times. Been ordered to do things enough times by God. And argued. Handled things on my own. Done things on my own. And all those times, the Lord just lets me rub myself out just a little bit more. Rub myself out just a little bit more. Do you understand that the Lord is cool with letting you go off and get to the end of yourself? He's okay with that. He's cool with you just going out. You think you know what's better for your life? Okay, go ahead. Go nuts. The one thing he didn't do with the prodigal son was try to stop him. He said, go ahead. Go nuts. Here's all your money. 
All your stuff, do whatever you want with it. He'll let you get right to the end of yourself. But after that, you get seasoned a little bit. And you don't want to fight with God no more. You don't want to go toe-to-toe with God anymore. You don't want to deal with the things that you've dealt with in your life before. You don't want to, you're done fighting with Jesus because you don't win. That's a real basic biblical premise. And he seasons you a little bit. And then you get to the point where you just listen to him now. You just listen to him. And he honors faith. If you're willing to just listen to God and do what he tells you to do. Give up whatever it is that he's calling you to give up and give it to him because it's his anyway. Nothing belongs to us. There is nothing that God has ever given us that we won't give back to him and he will not return a hundredfold. He will always, always give more than you. Always. He will give more than me. Whether it's time, talent, or treasure. You worship him with all of those things, with sacrifice, true sacrificial living, and the Lord will return because God will not be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, so shall he reap. He will not be mocked. He will not be made to look like a fool or a liar, especially when it comes to his word. And it might, might hurt you a little bit first. might hurt. But he will not be mocked. He's not going to be mocked by me. He's not going to be mocked by you. And God told him to offer up his Isaac, and he did. Abraham offered him up. Ready to plunge it down. But God intervened. Verse 19. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose. And they went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told to Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Who is his firstborn? Booz, his brother. Camuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Fildash, Jidlaf, Bethuel, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. And these eight Milka bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Rima, also bore Teba, Gehem, Thahash, Makab. We'll get into the next chapter next week. But what we see here through these chapters is you start to see the Godhead. You start to see the work, especially in chapter 22, of God the Father and God the Son. But then we start to see the work of the Spirit going to get a bride for the promised Son. You know the word Eleazar actually means comforter? We're going to read that in a couple of weeks. It's a great story. Read ahead. Study up on it. But I'll say this, and I want to leave you with this and we'll close. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because those who come to God must realize that He is. And that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. There's no other greater thing that the Lord has given us, truly, other than the faith and salvation, but truly, the faith that He's given us, the gift of faith that He's given us, to be able to grow and to really truly know the heart of God as Jehovah Jireh, our provider. The provider of everything that we need spiritually, the provider of everything that we need naturally. The provider. He is a giver. He is a giving God. And He will restore to you years that you lost. He will give back to you everything that you give to Him. And He gives you back more. Especially, especially whether it's time, talent, or treasure. Especially if you're using what He gives you to glorify His Son. If you're looking to get anything out of your walk with God, and you're looking to just pocket that and take that home and not give anything back out, 
then listen, at the end of the day, he's going to stop giving because what you don't use, you what? Lose. Biblical concept. That's Bible stuff 101. But if you are willing to take even something as small as your time and you're willing to give that to him, he will give it back to you. That's a promise. He'll test you and bring it to the edge. You're going to get rattled and shaken a little bit, but every once in a while, every once in a while, the reason why he'll tell you exactly why he's doing it. He'll tell you exactly why you're going through some of the things. He doesn't tell us all why in the midst of it, but we read his word and he gives us the answer there in his word. He didn't tell Job why he had to go through the things that Job went through. He never, ever, you know, you read the book of Job, it's a really long book, a long poetic book. You read the book of Job all throughout that book. Even up to the very end, God never told Job what was going on in the backstory. Never told him, never explained it to him because he doesn't have to. In fact, he told Job that he doesn't have to. Where were you, Job, when I made the earth? Can you walk inside of a snowflake, Job? Because I can. That's what he said. But he gives us the answers anyway. He does. He loves you. He's not torturing you. He's perfecting himself in you. Amen?